a very good morning to all. Uh, today's uh, topic is self-management of hepatic en encephalopathy, and it's an important topic because we have to understand the intricacies that are uh, associated with the self-management. So the brief outline would be the disease burden, especially the covert HE, which is the main uh, issue as far as the self-management is concerned. Identifying the need that why we actually require a self-management or a strong self-management protocol. Effect of HE on the patient, it affects the cognitive verbal fluency as well as the sleep. We'll also discuss about the effect of HE on caregivers, how to diagnose covert HE, the treatment, and uh, how we are moving ahead with remote monitoring and wearable devices. So as far as the cirrhosis is concerned, it's not an old age disease. That is the most important thing to understand. Where in this Lancet publication, they have shown that the most of the mortality they occur, they peak at around 50 years. And, it's, uh, and the patients of cirrhosis, they die at a much earlier age as compared to those with diabetes, cancer, or other malignancies, especially uh, in the age group of 30 to 50. And the self-management should include activities related to the medical management as well as the emotional management, problem-solving, decision-making, and social support. The overall global burden of cirrhosis is high with the daily estimated uh, loss of the uh, and daily estimate is around 41.4 million, and it's a very prevalent disease with decompensated cirrhosis of around 10.2. So how cirrhosis and HE, uh, the um, burden is concerned, the incidence of HE is around 11.6 per 100 patient year. Prevalence of covert HE or CHE has been reported to 30 to 85 percent of cirrhotic patients whenever they are tested. The overt HE estimate occurs uh, at around 30 to 50 percent of cirrhosis with an annual risk of development in around 20 percent. And alcohol-related cirrhosis and presence of portal hypertension, they have higher association. So identifying the opportunities of HE self-management, the first study by work published in American Journal of Castro where uh, a intervention questionnaire was done for a patient of 150, median age of 57. Overt HE was seen in 23 percent with uh, um, uh, most of the proportion of patient uh, with CTP, A and B. At baseline, what they found that only 56% of the patient, they understood how to titrate the dose of lactulose. Only 12% knew that they have to eat a high protein diet and 44% they uh, had this uh, idea that they have to avoid unsafe over the counter medication. Another study where a retrospective cohort of patient of, uh, uh, was studied who had attended the emergency or were hospitalized for HE. Uh, the, uh, all these patients, 100% of these patients had hepatic NKF at uh, presentation, but within 30 days of discharge, only 36% of these patients, they actually came for their refilling of their treatment for HE. And the adherence of medication, that is more than 80% adherence, was seen in only 16% at the end of three months and 10% at the end of six months. This uh, study by uh, Dr. Praveen Sharma, uh, where a cross-sectional 21-item survey-based study was there of 251 patients. Higher proportion of patients were in the CTP B and C, and they found that only the nutritional targets that could be met by most of the patients for calorie and protein intake were less. Another study where uh, the patients were, uh, again, uh, questionnaire-based, 34% they were unsure that they had decompensation, uh, decompensation at presentation. 14% they were unsure if HE was a part of decompensation, and any uh, uncertainty for uh, decompensation in these patients had a lower uh, health-related quality of life. Then a uh, few more uh, studies where the caregivers were also, care partners were also assessed, and it was seen that the patient were aware of HE history uh, based on the SF36 questionnaire, and the uh, awareness of uh, caregiver was seen in only 48% in patients who had a history of HE. They, were, uh, they knew that 6% of these caregivers, they knew that how to manage the treatment for HE and what could be the side effect. Uh, in this study, uh, published in 2019 by Jasmohan Bajaj, and they also uh, selected those patients who were discharged, who were admitted for non-elective reasons, that is reasons not related def uh, pertaining to HE, but within 90 days of discharge, what they found that HE caused the admission or diagnosis during hospitalization, but uh, 272 patients were not on HE treatment on follow-up. 
this is uh, also there is a uh, effect on the quality of life even in those patients who are on liver transplant uh, list where uh, it was seen that patients of more than uh, smell sodium of more than 20 they have significant impairment of the health related quality of life that affects the anxiety fear uh, component depression fatigue and physical impairment and he was the strongest predictor uh, for the uh, impairment of the health related quality of life in this set of patient it is also important to understand that he is one of the important reasons for readmission in cirrhosis where uh, in 2016 dr bajaj in 1013 patient they found that readmission rate at 3 months was 53% and majority of these patients were readmitted for he and the infants uh, that uh, higher melt and prior history of he were the main reason for readmission another study where a 28 day readmission was assessed it was seen that 31% of these patient were readmitted and he was the strongest factor and even at 6 months it was seen that in another study by ruy gasper where they found that readmission rate was nearly up to 60% with he as the most important factor then how it affects the caregivers in 2011 104 patients of cirrhosis and their caregivers were assessed caregiver were assessed based on the patient care burden questionnaire and it was seen that patients who had he the effect of he previous episode if there is a previous episode these caregivers also had a worse uh, outcome as far as their unemployment is concerned their financial support and the burden is concerned and it, this was seen uh, even in uh, higher in proportion of patients who were having impairment as far as the speaking or ability of walking is concerned this study uh, of a cohort of 541 patient it was seen that the social support and risk of mortality is also associated were more frequent uh, and these uh, components were more frequent in individuals who had cirrhosis as compared to comparators that is the low social support loneliness and higher proportion of patients were living alone and this was also correlating with the mortality risk seen in these set of patient so how he affects the patient it may affect the cognitive impairment a verbal uh, fluency as well as sleep the um, memory impairment is seen in patients where the memory status was assessed by the weschler memory scale around 22% of this patient they had grade 1 he but as for when they were assessed for the cognitive impairment it was seen that nearly 692 up to 92% of these patient uh, who were having cirrhosis without any prior history of he they had cognitive impairment and those patient who had he this decrement was seen in up to 100% of the patient then other effects that is seen in covert he includes the uh, cognitive reserve which is uh, proportionately uh, less in patients who had covert he this cognitive uh, reserve was based on the uh, berona index which is a questionnaire which is also based on the weschler memory scale and in this patient 118 patients who were assessed who none of these patient had overt he 49% of these patient when assessed based on the phes uh, they had covert he and they were also assessed for health related quality of life psychosocial score cognitive reserve and the sickness impact profile and these patients were found to have lower cognitive reserve they had a poor health related quality of life and these factors were independent of their mental status they it also affects that increased risk of hospitalization where uh, patients with uh, 170 patient where covert he was seen in 56% of the patient and the progression from covert to overt he was seen in 30% these patient had higher hospitalization and increased proportion of patient had mortality within 6 months unsafe driving is another important factor that we need to understand as far as the overall care giving burden for a, a cirrhosis patient is concerned where 205 patients were assessed mhe based on phe score was diagnosed in 48% and 163 patients of these 48% uh, percent, uh, 163 of the total proportion they took the driving simulation test and they found that most of these patient higher proportion of these patient had unsafe driving in the terms of taking a wrong turn or unable to negotiate small uh, this uh, driving skills then another important factor uh, that uh, gets affected when patient of cirrhosis with chi is concerned is their slow speech where the speech was assessed in this uh, study published in american journal of gastro and they found that the three important features of speech that is the uh, speech rate word duration and use of particles 
they were significantly less as compared to those patients who were not having overt HE. It also affects the sleep in cirrhotic patient. Uh, in this study pub uh, published uh, where 145 patients were assessed, grade 1 was diagnosed based on the West Haven criteria and MHE was assessed based on the CFF and PHE score. They also studied the health-related quality of life and the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Overall proportion, uh, out of 145, nearly 41% of these patients had covert uh, HE. And when they found that, uh, they found that the covert HE was associated with uh, with health-related quality of life as well as with decreased sleep based on the PSQI index. So how to assess a covert HE? It is, it is, uh, the gold standard is paper pencil, that is the PHE score, which is gold standard. A score of less than 0.4 and a score of less than 0.6 has poor survival. Less than 0.4 it uh, assesses for CHE with a high sensitivity and specificity. The uh, RBENS or the recurrent uh, brain assessment, uh, which is also uh, a paper pencil uh, method, it also uh, assesses the uh, covert HE, but the main drawback with these two methods is that it takes time, 20, nearly 25 to 30 minutes. Another important uh, issues, uh, methods are the computerized or the inhibitory control test the CFF and the NKFL uh, Stroop test. Uh, we'll study this uh, NCFL Stroop uh, on uh, detail because this has, been, uh, uh, this has been studied as far as the remote um, assessment is concerned. So how this Stroop smartphone application work that uh, in this patient, uh, the patients, they are assessed for off-state and on-state. Off-state gives a neutral stimuli. On-state is an incongruent stimuli. In the first, uh, this thing, the, you have to identify the color, and the, uh, once the color is identified, uh, it, then the screen switches to uh, an another jumble. In the on state, the color of the uh, words are identified, like green is written in red, but you have to uh, opt for red. So the overall, the on time and off time are calculated. And uh, it was seen that in patients who have covert HE, uh, on time plus off time of more than 275 seconds is important, is uh, significant. The only issue is that it runs in five sets. Each set, set has around 10 uh, different uh, assessment. So it takes nearly 10 minutes. And, but this has been validated in various studies that it, uh, it correlates with the uh, diagnosis of, uh, of CHE based on the PHEs score. This has also been studied uh, when patients were, uh, were assessed for their driving simulation, and it was seen that a, a score of 242 was uh, significantly associated with uh, driving simulation crashes and illegal turns. Then there is a shortened version where uh, they found that, in, uh, published recently, that a shortened version, that is, it usually takes less than one minute, it detects covert HE in, uh, uh, within one minute, and what they found that this has a good correlation when uh, they uh, assessed with the complete assessment. Then the, another important aspect to study in cirrhotic patient uh, is the cognitive impairment. This is just the number of apps that are available. In this study, what they found that the number of apps which were uh, available for cognitive impairment is, usual, is around more than 109, out of which these 25 were assessed. But what we can see that most of these uh, apps, they don't have any reliability for the normative data. They have less reliability. There is no validity. And most of these apps, they are not even connected with a caregiver uh, provider. So it is just like a score uh, with no actual output as far as the patient's assessment is concerned. And as of now, the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Association, they still consider that self-administered zero cognitive examination is the best instrument tool for assessment of the mild cognitive impairment. Another uh, assessment for uh, CHE uh, is the animal naming test, which was uh, published in hepatology in 2017, where the animal names were shown, and anything more than 15, that, that is the right estimation of 15 animal names, was found to have uh, uh, correlate with that patient does not have uh, encephalopathy. But the important aspect to consider in this, find, uh, in this finding is that the covert HE patient, they might not have uh, impairment of the verbal, there is an impairment of the verbal fluency. So just naming one uh, animal name might not be as much relevant as far as the diagnosis is concerned. 
So as uh, the treatment, uh, the uh, lactulose has been uh, compared with uh, no treatment and in most of the psychometric analysis, it was seen that uh, lactulose has fared better as uh, compared to the non-lactulose regime. Same with the rifaximin, where uh, uh, randomized control trials have assessed the driving simulation, cognitive impairment, and the uh, sickness uh, profile. And they have seen that uh, patients' overall quality of life improves with rifaximin. And uh, same with the uh, LOLA also has been seen in various RCTs, that psychometric analysis assessment for CHE. And they have seen that L LOLA uh, improves as compared to lactose or placebo. Now, going ahead with the remote monitoring or wearables, that how self-management could be improved with remote uh, monitoring. So this publication, uh, which showed that the number of publications uh, for cirrhosis, which are actually uh, uh, taking care of the remote monitoring or mobile health is least as compared to depression, addiction, cancer, or heart failure. And what the uh, authors, they want to comment that there is a huge scope as far as the overall management with the remote uh, monitoring is concerned, like this deep disturbance, cognitive changes, oxygen saturation change, there is a heart rate change which may uh, be affected in uh, infection. The acti activity level scale, which might uh, change as far as the frailty and uh, HE is concerned, the ascites and heart failure. But th there are challenges. The challenges and recommendation for a successful implementation, as was, uh, uh, as was stated by the multidisciplinary NIH Big Data Workshop, they say that there should be a clearly defined problem and a disease state. There should be an integrated system of healthcare delivery, technology support and services, personalized experience, enhanced end user experience, aligned payment and clinical and stakeholder support. And they say that the three V's are most important. That is the verification of the, of the, instru uh, of the instrument or the data that is generated. There should be a proper analytical validation of the huge amount of raw data that is generated. And there should be some meaningful clinical validation. So these, uh, parameters were assessed in the remote monitoring in cirrhosis, like in the Patient Buddy app, which was uh, uh, published in 2017 by the uh, by uh, Jasmohan Bajaj group, where they studied the impact of 30-day readmission, uh, out of which the total and HE-related admissions were monitored, and there were 40 patients and 40 caregivers. They found that 17 patients were readmitted in 30 days, but none of these patients were admitted for HE eight potential HE-related readmissions could be prevented because the app generated some alert which resulted into early intervention. And most of these enrolled patients and caregivers, were they were responding favorably. The second study that I could find was the feasibility study, where a smartphone app-based facilitating the outpatient ascites management. In these patients were given a Bluetooth-enabled weight scale, and 30-day readmission for ascites control or uncontrolled ascites was assessed. Any change in the weighing scale of more than 5 pounds up or below, uh, more than increase of 5 pounds or decrease, and that was uh, alerted to the patient as well as the caregivers. And it was found that nearly 52% of these patients were triggered by weight loss and 48% were triggered by weight gain. 17 readmissions occurred, but only four related to ascites. And they found that many of these patients, they wanted to extend their participation beyond 30 days. Then another important variable, uh, which is very much now in common use, is the sleep tracking devices. So sleep tracking device, this is in the sleep study. The, uh, this study was not performed in the cirrhotic patient, but there is a large study uh, which is uh, published for the cirrhotic patients. Uh, which I'll explain later. So in this study, the performance of the sleep tracking device along with their ActiGraph. ActiGraph is the activity graph that the app generates. Of these seven uh, assessed, and these were the seven uh, the uh, commonly or the commercially available, uh, the wristbands which are available. Out of these, four are wearable and three were unwearable. And what they found that based, the uh, gold standard was the plethysmography. So what they found that there is a promising performance for tracking of sleep and wake. But in this study, these apps, they only studied two parameters, that is whether patient is sleeping or he is awake. In the WHOOP functionality, uh, which is now versioned into a WHOOP 3.0, where the actigraph was uh, con uh, compared in the auto and the manual mode, and this has 
two uh, uh, this thing. One is the two stage that is sleep and wake, and one is the four stage that is it assess the awake state, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep. And, and this also correlated pretty much well with the plethysmography. For this, the, in the cirrhosis patient, for covert HED, the variable technology was assessed in 25 patient of uh, extending up to six months with 2,892 nights overall sleep data was assessed. They found that 66.3% of these patients, they had steady adherence. Patients with CHV were consistently worse sleep and reduction in rapid eye movement. The reduction in the REM sleep was seen in CHE patient and those in the restorative phase. And based on this, they found a CHE score, which is based on the albumin, bilirubin, rapid eye movement, and the sleep disturbance and sleep consistency. So to summarize, the cognitive impairment is a critical component, and it is, it would, it is a part of the cirrhosis patient which needs care, just like the Alzheimer's disease that is early to diagnose and uh, long-term treatment because continuous decline in the, prognosis, uh, in the performance of cognitive assessment in encephalopathy will be there as patient will move from covert to H, uh, overt. And this is the main factor that why caregiver support and uh, social support is important. There is no single test as far as CHE diagnosis is concerned, but Stroop test has fared better in many clinical applicability. Post-COVID, this study was published from the Canadian uh, uh, Dr. Punita Tandon's group, where they found that patients' interest with video consultation and online personalized care has improved in the post-COVID era. But the acceptance for any app-based treatment would be based on the social demographic factor, and what they f in this study found that the initial acceptance may be high, but they might not be uh, willing to continue it for a long-term basis. Remote monitoring is a potential to understand relationship between the intra-individual cognitive and various outcomes of encephalopathy for targeted intervention. And there is a huge scope as far as the dry lead portable EEG is concerned, evoked potential response and gate analysis by this Multicon insole system. In this, the, foot, uh, the footwear sole, it is uh, having uh, different gadgets and the way the patient uh, walks or gait uh, that generates a raw data which has been seen to correlate with various neurocognitive impairment. Then another important aspect for the self-management includes the nursing care, where the Lever Hope Nursing Project has uh, identified that early identification of complement, uh, complication, management of nutritional and specific instruction as far as the outpatient and inpatient is concerned and, uh, is very important. Then telemedicine and liver disease care gives a unique opportunity to do to deliver care remotely, easy adaptability, high patient rate acceptability, but yes, reduced face-to-face -face assessment will remain a challenge always. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to conclude that how a mobile health platform for cognitive impairment in cirrhosis will be, uh, could be managed that the actively uh, collected app-based data or any wearable device, a uh, huge big data would be generated but a proper analytical verification and a clinical validity is required before any meaningful uh, self-management uh, care or instruction could be provided to the patient or his caregiver. And this is one uh, uh, letter to editor by uh, Dr. Jess Bajaj where they found that out of 130 uh, 30 physicians or liver disease care providers, that is the doctors who are uh, practicing hepatology, they found that they offer screening to covert HE in nearly around 50 to 60 percent only. The main reason for not offering the screening for a covert HE is lack of time or lack of consensus or probably shortage of staff. But most of us think that overt and covert HE may actually impair our driving skill. So is it medically correct if CHE is diagnosed or missed for diagnosis? Very nice, uh, uh, Rajan, you put it correctly. We are not diagnosing it, and uh, we, uh, at least I feel guilty of not sending all patients of cirrhosis for assessing covert uh, hepatic encephalopathy. Although I do the verbal tests very often, but not the yes, uh, objective tests which are required. And uh, 
the problems remain of uh, analysis even if you have this mobile app someone has to read it out and see yes, sir. now there is a new method which i know is called hear me so the patients are required to give 30 seconds of uh, their verbal thing and post it and by having serial uh, hear me like six months ago how he was speaking now how is he speaking and others yes, that can be integrated into this i have yes, one sir. or two questions to you uh, is the Stroop test Indian version or Hindi version being available or no? No, sir. Stroop test is actually... It it's is just green and red colors yes, are sir. there. You have to say if it is showing... So actually, this uh, I only took this test. Yeah. But it is... Uh, initially, it is difficult, but the only thing is that it takes around 10 to 12 minutes to complete one test. But uh, if we target our specific population that where this is the animal naming test is a very good test yes sir it can be done for children also yes sir i had made the first indian version of the number uh, connection and others i had made it trail making we published it i think it will be worthwhile if you and others can make some indian version and validate for lot of test for critical frequency, lot of things to be used in MHG, but nothing has come into practice. What is the problem? Sir, if we go according to the uh, questionnaire to the f physicians, then probably we are not uh, we are not inclined to diagnose CHE rather than to say that the Stroop test is not functioning. If uh, in a questionnaire, if someone is saying that they 60% only are uh, assessing patient for HE, then in real practice probably not even 30% might be assessing for CHE. No, we but, know, but there is definitely a gap in that. Yes, sir. There but CF, CFF has uh, shown to have very good predictability for 39 hertz. And uh, that is a very simple test. We have it in the hospital. Yes, sir. We should use CFF more often. And uh, it is correlation has seen to up to 83% uh, compared to the conventional gold standard PHES. That is the paper pencil method. Since it is more so that it's the adult hepatology who deals with it, and I think we should have a protocol based on, like Sir always says, but this specially, because after interpretation, what then? Yeah. Are you going to send him to a special clinic where somebody specialized is going to read that and also have a protocol based approach for that patient? Before we do a remote uh, monitoring, we can actually start with our uh, outpatient clinic, and that's, that is why I, in this summary I have shown that the nursing care. <laughs> Uh, as, is important I as far as the nursing can definitely no nursing care means not for care but for uh, specialized nursing who actually could uh, spend uh, 10 minutes 15 minutes time assessing for the CHE we and train our nurses, train our nurses not in the uh, ward at least in the OPD for 10 to 15 minutes dedicated time I think we'll develop the protocol I would work with you and uh, Seema from the pediatric side this is a limitation and we should do it. Because recently one patient, he asked for fit to join, which I gave, but uh, on the second visit I asked him that what exactly he do. So he's a driver in a uh, government office. So how could, without assessing CHE, one could? So that is also not uh, knowing that the once HE has happened, mm -hmm. is it persisting? Has it totally improved or MHE persist? That data is also lacking. I think someone has to dedicate for HE work. Any other comments, Dr. Call or neurology? Any comments? In correlation with ammonia, ammonia should also be used yes, more sir. often. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
good morning everyone so today's topic uh, is diagnostic and prognostic histopathological evaluation in cases of drug induced liver injury so the outline would be a brief introduction <coughs> uh, liver biopsy uh, when, when it is done in delhi histology and delhi diagnosis the pattern and the prognostic aspect of histology ilbs data and uh, way forward so i'll start with the case uh, this is a, a 58 year male he has progressive uh, uh, distension of abdomen for last 4 months and uh, that's why he has a weight gain and early fatigability of 3 months uh, weight loss for 1 month the differential diagnosis in this case was uh, probably drug induced liver injury or cirrhosis or nash or portal hypertension non bleeder and decompensated ascites with jaundice so we received this biopsy with this information and the liver biopsy it showed a diffuse effacement of architecture and a distortion because of these these fibrous looking like tissues this is the liver parenchyma this is the inflammatory area so this is a 10x view of liver biopsy and on mt there was a fibrosis <coughs> in the portal area with some bridging and it is also going towards the uh, uh, peri uh, peri uh, cellular areas so th there was a chicken wire fibrosis as well in this case now in hyper view you can see there are a lot of neutrophils around the balloon hepatocytes and these balloon hepatocytes they are containing lot of mallory denk like bodies but there is no steatosis no uh, cholestasis seen in in the hepatocytes or canalicular areas so diffuse mallory denk bodies with ballooning degeneration and neutrophilic satellitosis these uh, th two things were there associated with the pericellular fibrosis as well as the bridging fibrosis so this case was of amiodarone toxicity and uh, uh, we 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 it took us a lot of time to diagnose this this case i'll move to the next case that is a uh, 67 year male who had some malignancy and was on uh, anti chemotherapy drugs so uh, sorry chemotherapeutic drugs and he had cholestatic jaundice so this is the 10x view of liver biopsy here you can see these areas showing perivenular areas they are showing cholestasis and this is the portal area which is not showing any fibrosis inflammation or anything else this slide i would request the residents if at all they are listening is that the way the forms are filled you have no details of labs nothing on physical <coughs> and no x ray or other things by request if you do not provide data how will the pathologist go to a proper conclusive diagnosis please yeah Yeah, all these data should be provided. Okay. So this is the uh, higher power view of the portal area, which is showing the duct loss. This is the uh, portal vein. This is the portal area with the background stroma, and this is the artery. It is devoid of ducts. So this is a ductopenic condition, and this is the perivenular area, which is showing inspissated cholestasis in this case. So this was a. uh vanishing bile duct disease without any fibrosis and it was associated with the cholestasis this is case 3 uh there was a acute cholestatic hepatitis because of tilly or query big brick he had itching and uh, jaundice for last 2 months it's a 19 year uh, male patient and again it is showing the expansion of little bit of expansion of portal area which is uh, showing this is the artery area and it is devoid of duct and also there was a cellular as well as the canalicular cholestasis in the uh, liver parenchyma so again it is a case of uh, vanishing bile duct disease <coughs> with portal and periportal fibrosis this is case number 4 uh, a 41 year male he had a, a differential diagnosis of delhi aih and uh, that was during the covid time and there was a history of geloid intake geloid intake for last 6 months so this is the liver biopsy it is showing diffuse effacement of the architecture and there is lot of inflammatory infiltrate this is the liver parenchyma these these are the inflammatory areas we will see in hyper view what these areas are 
and again this is the second core which is also showing the similar picture so on uh, uh, empty stain there was a fibrosis and also there was there were areas of necrosis the dark stained areas is fibrosis light stained areas is probably necrosis and we can confirm it by the orsine stain uh, so it is uh, taking the light stain so these are all areas of necrosis and because this is surrounding a liver uh, nodule so it is a bridging fibrosis or more than uh, more than the bridging sorry bridging necrosis and these these necrotic areas they were inflamed uh, they, they were infl infiltrated by the inflammatory cells there is lot of inflammatory infiltrate here again you can see the bridging necrosis areas lot of inflammatory infiltrate and this inflammatory uh, inflammatory cells they were lymphoplasmacytic they were showing interface activity and also giant cell transformation of the hepatocytes pseudo rositing of hepatocytes so all the histological features of the autoimmunity were there in this case and also the, the these are clusters of plasma cells in this case and we diagnose this case as a drug induced uh, autoimmune hepatitis and uh, this is a relatively easy case where there was a history of methotrexate intake of uh, more than 20 years so there was a fibrosis so it was sent for the staging of fibrosis so it is a bridging fibrosis in a methotrexate toxicity of liver so <clears throat> why we do liver biopsy in delhi with these cases we can we can uh, consider that in suspected cases of delhi it aids in diagnosis like we have given the amiodarone toxicity when there is a clinical uncertainty uh, and it assess the severity of liver damage like we see in case of uh, drug induced autoimmune hepatitis it also uh, exclude the findings of dr uh, duct loss necrosis or advanced fibrosis which we saw in in uh, vbds that is vanishing bile duct disease and necrosis in autoimmune uh, drug induced autoimmune hepatitis and advanced fibrosis in methotrexate toxicity some of the newer drugs uh, they have little or no record of liver injury so the biopsy may provide information about some mechanistic aspect and liver biopsy uh, may be the only way of diagnosis certain liver injury specifically the vascular injuries the severity and character of histological injury, injury may also uh, hint towards the prognosis and uh, uh, most of the condition where there is a pre existing liver injury so again it will give about the prognosis or a uh, damage of the liver parenchyma so systemic approach in case of histological evaluation is uh, first to identify the pattern of injury what kind of pattern of injury is there then uh, possibly a suspected agent can be identified based on the pattern of injury and uh, to exclude other causes of injury and then we draw the conclusions so this is the chart showing the morphological patterns in drug induced liver injury the broadly i'll come in detail uh, in in upcoming slides so the necroinflammatory injury cholestatic mixed the, that is the most common and steatotic vascular or fibrosis or cirrhosis which is very very rarely seen in case of drug induced liver injury so the frequent pattern which we encounter in in the liver biopsy is the mixed cholestatic hepatitic and second is the acute hepatitis pattern of in injury and then chronic hepatitis so these are the most common pattern of liver injury which we uh, see in the liver biopsy what is the use uh, usefulness of this pattern rec recognition because it will help us to narrow down the differential diagnosis and suggest most probable drugs or differential drugs which can cause this and may reflect sometimes the pathogenesis of liver injury now coming to the uh, histology uh, uh, for the diagnosis of drug induced liver injury so first pattern is necroinflammatory so necroinflammatory can be uh, first first pattern in the uh, uh, in the necroinflammatory in injury is acute coagulative necrosis so coagulative necrosis uh, is, is in the western literature is very well defined for the uh for the acetaminophen toxicity where the zone 3 necrosis extensive necrosis is there and it will lead to acute liver failure so and the second pattern of coagulative necrosis where the inflammation is minimal and the hepatocyte injury is minimal but there is a loss of hepatocytes uh in specific area so this is in zone 3 this is in zone 1 so in zone 1 uh, when there is a uh, this this necro uh, this uh, coagulative necrosis then the toxic substance abuse can be uh, can can be uh, identified like the phosphorus or the sulfose poisoning a case which we have seen uh, one of the uh, liver biopsy 
and uh, in these cases the latency period is relatively low uh, the alt because of the hepatocyte damage it is quite high and often it is on of abrupt onset the second pattern is the acute hepatic injury where we can see whole lot of pattern where there can be uh, there can be multi acinar necrosis there can be areas of confluent necrosis again the bridging necrosis and sometimes only the apoptosis of hepatocytes without any inflammation or significant inflammation and the uh, uh, the inflammatory infiltrate in the perivenular areas that is the perivenulitis so uh, delay it and uh, accounts for the 10% of total ac acute hepatitis hepatitis after the viral hepatitis is and it uh, represent 30% of the delay this uh, almost 30% of the delay cases they they will present like acute hepatitis injury the common implicated uh, drugs are herbal medications especially in india and the uh, anti convulsant or anti uh, epileptic drugs also the att especially the isoniazid can also lead to uh, acute hepatic injury pattern uh, a specific type of uh, acute hepatitis which is the indian file pattern of inflammatory infiltrate it is uh, seen in 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 the anti leprotic drugs acute liver failure uh, can be seen with the atts acetaminophen and antimicrobial and anti epileptic drug Uh, the histomorphological pattern in case of delia associated alf can be extensive microvas uh, microvascular steatosis where there is uh, there is no inflammation there is no necrosis but the hepatocytes all of them are showing microvascular steatosis and there can be the necrosis associated with the inflammatory infiltrate which is the most common type and only the necrosis which we see saw in case of uh, poisoning and the acetaminophen toxicity the granulomatous pattern uh, is uh, very very rare and we uh, we rarely see well defined granuloma in case of uh, delhi but a vague granuloma can be can be noted which are associated with the eosinophil infiltrate and also a, a fibrin ring granuloma where the steatotic vacuole is surrounded by the uh, epithelioid cells and that is seen in uh, in allopurinol and bcg chronic hepatitis Uh, so the chronic hepatitis pattern can be of two type one is the non aih associated where the the inflammatory infiltrate is there some amount of fibrosis is there but the autoimmunity markers or the igg is not positive so th so drugs that can uh, co cause the uh, chronic hepatitis pattern is this, uh, this anti hypertensive and diclofenac and nemosolide because of that it was banned in uh, most of the countries which can show the uh, chronic hepatitis pattern now coming to the uh, the important aspect of chronic hepatitis in delhi is delhi associated aih so delhi associated aih it is often insidious in onset and it uh, it uh, takes around 3 months to develop the liver injury and the syndrome is prolonged and it can lead to Uh, chronicity and also the relapse of autoimmune hepatitis the commonly implicated drug in western literature is minocycline nitrofurantoin uh, mostly these two uh, approximately 70% or 73% of the cases are because of minocycline and nitrofurantoin and less commonly hydralazine and procainamide they uh, 50% of the uh, these the drug induced liver injury because of this can be of delhi ais type now in delhi aih when you see the liver biopsy there will be similar features of autoimmune hepatitis where there will be lot of inflammatory infiltrate interface activity this is the interface activity showing uh, it is going towards the liver parenchyma and this these are the lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate so how to differentiate uh, histologically whether this is a, this is a de novo aih or or delhi related aih some of the histological features uh, have been uh, uh, suggested that is prominent intracellular lymphocytes cholestatic or can, uh, cholestatic hepatocyte and, as well as the canalicular which are more common in delhi and prominent portal and acinar neut neutrophils but these are suggested and they have not been uh, reproduced later and we have never encountered uh, such difference differences between de, de novo aih or delhi aih except that in case of aih we consider it as a, as a chronic disease most of the time not always Uh, so some amount of fibrosis 
at least uh, the the fibrosis stage of two is there in de novo AIH. Whether in case of Delhi, the median uh, uh, fibrosis is approximately one, or there is no fibrosis. So these are the histological features which were suggested. The similar features which we see in AIH will be there. The interface activity, the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, the pseudorositing, and the endothelitis. But some of the features which, which have been that the... Uh, sorry, sorry. sorry to interrupt, uh, Chagan. Would zone 3 injury be more in uh, Delhi AIH versus AIH? In AIH, will you have zone 3 injury? Yes, sir, we can see. Especially younger patient will uh, will show the perivenulitis as well in Delhi. Uh, in sir, uh, Delhi related AL, ALF, it is one of the diagnostic criteria where the, there should be perivenulitis uh, associated with lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate. So uh, the histological features which were suggested is lymph, uh, lymphocyte in the lobules and canalicular cholestasis, but they are not reproducible. So Delhi AIH, uh, some of the studies which indicated uh, that Delhi AIH is still common in female and uh, they have a, a longer time of onset and also the res resolution time is prolonged and often uh, related with the autoimmune features like the IgG positivity, ANA positivity. Um, uh, also the Delhi related AIH, they can relapse and uh, the absence of peripheral eosinophilia is a, a poor prognostic indicator. Basically, the, if the eosinophilia is there, then the resolution of the uh, daily related AIH is much more common than in absence of peripheral eosinophilia. I'm sorry, uh, I'm a little fast because the slides are uh, this this topic is is long, and time is uh, is only 30 minutes. So. <laughs> The another article which uh, which highlights some of the points which are related to Delhi AIH that uh, it is associated again with the nitrofurantoin and aminocycline mostly and the, the, the genetic markers or genetic predisposition in Delhi AIH is often not found in this study, especially in this study. They have not uh, identified this and uh, the, the uh, oh, sorry. Again, and the ANA and ASMA positivity can be seen in approximately 70% of the cases, but the SLA or the LKM1 positivity is not uh, seen in Delhi AIH. Now coming to the second pattern, that is the Delhi cholestasis. So Delhi cholestasis can be acute or chronic or extra hepatic drug-induced cholestasis, that is the PSC-like. So these three patterns have been defined. Uh, this is, this is the most common pattern which we see in case of Delhi cholestatic cholestasis where there can be cellular cholestasis like in androgens and estrogens uh, and also the body, body building supplements. Uh, because of this, we often see this bland cholestasis where there is no inflammation and uh, the, this cellular as well as the canalicular cholestasis, it is associated with the uh, antibiotics, especially the erythromycin, azithromycin and amoxicillin. And uh, one of benoxoprofen, I don't know what this drug is, but it can show this, uh, this uh, canalicular cholestasis. So these are the three uh, pure cholestatic pattern, only cellular cholestasis, cellular as well as the canalicular, and ductular uh, bile plugs without any inflammation. So it is a pure cholestatic pattern. And... Uh, Cholestasis with hepatitis injury, basically more of cholestasis, less hepatitis. So it can be seen in, in, uh, uh, in ATTs and in the anti-epileptic drugs. Basically, this is a common pattern, so any drug can show, but uh, mostly antibiotics and others can have this. Acute cholestasis, uh, chol cholestasis built with bile duct injury. It is uh, here, this, this is the bile duct, which is showing this inflammatory bile duct injury associated with the uh, uh, the lobular inflammation and uh, as well as the uh, cellular and canalicular cholestasis and this bile duct injury we can see in amoxicillin clavulinate. Vanishing bile duct disease where the, the inflammatory infiltrate is minimal. We have discussed a case the duct loss will be there in more uh, more than 50% of the portal areas and it, was, it is not associated with the fibrosis or progression. 
so it is the initial stage of the uh, of the duct loss uh, uh, injuries so the commonly implied drugs are antibiotics and anti epileptics chronic cholestasis it is very very rare so we do not encounter this type of uh, uh, pattern and biliary sclerosis it has been uh, identified in with five fluorouracil where psc like features can be there uh, which is given in the squamous cell carcinoma and we had two cases of this uh, type of biliary sclerosis in uh, in uh, cases of squamous cell carcinoma treated with five fluorouracil so the mechanism of drug induced cholestasis is is basically it has been attributed that the basolateral transporters or the canalicular transporters they are affected because of the drug or drug metabolites or sometimes the drug can cause the uh, the canalicular uh, uh, type of cell mem uh, cell membrane so that can lead to the cholestatic type of injury in case of drug induced liver injury this is the most uh, frequent uh, type of pattern which we see and any drug can cause this type of uh, mixed pattern uh, mostly it is again the anesthetics the anti epileptics and sometimes uh, the uh, the herbal uh, sorry uh, the other carbamazepine uh, antimicrobial drug can also uh, uh, show this mixed hepatic cholestatic but mostly in in antimicrobials it is a cholestatic type of liver injury now the uh steatosis and steatohepatitis basically microvesicular steatosis in in uh, toxic substances like cocaine or tetracycline valproate can can also show and valproate especially can also show because it has a high uh, potency of attaining the uh, tolerance so in liver biopsy uh, you may not see lot of uh, damage or any damage basically normal look, looking liver biopsy but ast alt may be elevated so this type of uh, injury we can see with valproate well toxicity macrovesicular with the uh, with the anesthetics and beta blockers so vascular type of injury vascular type of injury is associated with the chemotherapeutic drugs pyrolizumab on alkaloids and bone marrow transplantation where the obstructive or non obstructive type of uh, uh, sos can be or sinusoidal dilatation vod can be seen this is a example where the uh, sinusoidal obstruction sy syndrome the rbcs are extravasated in the uh, space of disse and that will lead to hepatocyte damage and subsequently the fibrosis so this uh, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome can be uh, seen with the chemotherapeutic and pyrolizidon alkaloid but uh, this type of injury uh, we are now seeing in post transplant patient especially with the sirolimus uh, those uh, treated with the sirolimus uh, in place of tacrolimus when they are not responding the sinusoidal dilatation uh, can be seen with the contraceptives and androgens where the uh, there are two type of sinusoidal dilatation basically with the with the normal layering of uh, sinusoidal endothelial cells uh, cells and without the sinusoidal endothelial cells when it is not there it is called peliosis hepatis and when this uh, endothelial lining is present it is a sinusoidal dilatation and both pattern can be seen in, with the contraceptives drug related nrh is uh, the dr drugs which Uh, are are all already known as a thioprene, cetirabine, oxaliplatin, and thioguanine can lead to uh, NRH type of injury where the the one of the area which is showing the hepatocyte atrophy, the another uh, area which is showing the normal hepatocytes, and they surround the normal hepatocyte areas with the, this atrophic type of hepatocyte cords. The HPS uh, hepatopotal sclerosis again it can be seen with the vinyl chloride and five fluorouracil. especially with this uh, this 5 fluorouracil we can see this uh, uh, hepatopotal sclerosis similar to the ncpf now coming to the second part that is the liver histology and outcome means the prognosis in drug induced liver injury so the chronicity so time so chronicity uh, Uh, formally the chronic delay was defined if the uh, perpetuating liver damage or the uh, increase liver function test after 3 months of drug withdrawal and then subsequently it was changed as a um, as a, as 
if it is of more than three months and six months based on the pattern of injury or type of injury, hepatocellular and the cholestatic type, three and six months. But it, now it has been uniformly uh, suggested that, uh, especially this in, in a recent article by the Spanish Delhi Registry, that the liver test abnormalities persisting after one year after, drug, dr after, after the drug discontinuation in, independent of the type of liver injury is considered as the chronic, chronic uh, delay. The risk factor for chronic delay are older age, female, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension and use of statin and jaundice is at presentation which requires the need of hospitalization and raised ALP that has been suggested as risk factor for the chronic delay. The chronicity, it has been, uh, uh, it has been, the incidence has been from 2 to 20 percent and the, the common type of pattern which was seen in chronic delay is uh, chronic delay isolated, uh, uh, vanishing bile duct disease, drug induced uh, AIH and secondary sclerosing cholangitis. Secondary sclerosing cholangitis is relatively very rare, cirrhosis is very, very rare and uh, most uh, phenotypes are chronic delay where the, uh, the biochemical uh, uh, normalization is not attained after one year or six months and drug induced AIH. Now the histological features which can suggest a good outcome or poor outcome, one of the article which suggested if the necrosis is more at the presentation or in the liver biopsy then the prognosis is fatal uh, which we can we, which we can uh, think that uh, be, because the liver parenchyma is de uh, damaged, so there will be a poor outcome, especially in uh, cases presenting as ALF. The the necrotic parenchyma more than 70 percent is indicative of poor uh, outcome. The presence of eosinophilia, whether in the liver biopsy or in the peripheral, it has uh, suggested a good feature for the uh, drug-induced liver injury. So uh, the other features which are, are, are of prognostic importance is the presence of uh, granulomas. It is indicative of better outcome. And uh, the necrosis, again, it is of uh, poor outcome. And ductular bile plugs, if it is there, then it is associated with the poor outcome. So predict uh, the prediction of biochemical non-resolution of patients with chronic drug-induced liver injury, this is a this is a large study with a lot of patients and also uh, the validation cohort was quite large, up about uh, 2,000 patients. So they suggested the histological features which are, uh, which are associated with the uh, poor outcome or the non-resolution of biochemical biochem uh, uh, markers is the liver inflammation. If at the uh, uh, baseline the HAI is more than 10, it is indicative of non-resolution or persistence of chronic delay and bile duct injury, it is also indicative of chronic delay. Uh, uh, those patients, uh, this is a hepatology article, again, uh, which is showing loss of duct. If it is there, then it is indicative of chronic delay and the this is uh, uh, even irreversible in 38% of the cases, but in this study, the, the, the patients were very less in number, so we cannot uh, draw a conclusion based on this study. And of, uh, obviously, the vanishing bile duct disease, which are associated with DILI, is has, has the favorable outcome than the other causes, which is leading to VBDS. The, the, uh, this is related to acute liver failure where they, there is no histological marker has been suggested as a, as a prognostic indicator, but they have suggested that age, baseline, ALT, hemoglobin and HBS antigen positivity, they are risk factor for the poor outcome in ATT related DILI ALF. Again, uh, in this study, death in liver transplantation within two years of on test, uh, onset of drug induced liver injury, no histological marker has been suggested. Higher bilirubin at presentation, coagulopathy, leukocytosis, and thrombocytopenia were the indicators of the poor outcome in case of delay related acute liver injury or acute liver failure. So natural course, uh, common type is mixed cholestatic hepatitic. Uh, the complete recovery occurs in more than 80% of the cases. 10% of the cases can present as ALF or severe acute injury. 5 to 10% 
the, based on the uh, uh, variable criteria, the chronicity can be there from 2 to 20 percent. So the chronicity pattern is VBDS, steatohepatitis, and vascular. Now coming to ILBS data, so uh, uh, we have see, seen uh, uh, 24,304 liver biopsies uh, till 30th September 2023. Out of them, 884 were of Delhi. Approximately the, this liver biopsy of Delhi were 3.6 percent. The most common pattern was uh, mixed hepatocellular canalicular injury. The second common was necroinflammatory. And among the necroinflammatory areas, acute coagulative necrosis because the acetaminophen toxicity is not very common in India, so very less. Acute hepatitis pattern was uh, much more common. Two antileprotic uh, drug taking patients presented with mononucleosis type of uh, morphology. No granulomatous we have seen. And multi asinar pan asinar necrosis or ALF 22 cases. Now, cholestatic. Um, among the cholestatic, acute intrahepatic uh, uh, cholestasis, mostly because of the bodybuilding supplements. And uh, the AIH-like pattern was seen in 95, uh, 95 cases. I'll come to this in little detail. And the chronic intrahepatic cholestasis or ducto ductopenic-like um, uh, chronic liver injury was seen in 11 patients. And the biliary sclerosis was uh, seen in two. Sorry, it was. It is written zero. The steatohepatic pattern was seen uh, in uh, 35, vascular in 47. Of them, sinusoidal dilatation and VOD-like, most, mostly after the post-transplant patients. And the hepatoportal sclerosis was seen in two patients. Basically, the hepatoportal uh, sclerosis and PSE-like, they are both with the uh, anti-chemotherapeutic, sorry, chemotherapeutic drugs. So two and two in each. There was. Uh, uh, there was some fibrosis or cirrhosis in uh, uh, there was a previous liver disease and it was superimposed by Delhi in 70. This is the third most common type of pattern. No neoplasm and the normal liver biopsy was seen in seven cases. So Delhi related AIH and ILBS were 95 and mostly the patients were during the COVID. Uh, when we saw uh, the wave of COVID, uh, 13, 28 and 27 patients. So. So more than 50% of the cases were uh, during the COVID. And the medication, which were, uh, the information was available out of 95 and 56. And mostly it was because of Giloy and other herbal medications were uh, uh, seen in uh, eight, eight patients. So in, in Delhi AIH, which we gave on the, uh, based on the liver biopsy as a, uh, drug-induced AIH or AIH. Sometimes it is a differential diagnosis, sometimes it is only the Delhi AIH. So the autoantibodies positivity, which was seen in 62% uh, of the cases where the data was available, and the IgG elevation was seen in 60% uh, again. Uh, this is another study which we published in uh, JCP where uh, the sinusoidal dilatation or congestion, uh, whether it is obstructive or non-obstructive type, was noted in uh, 25 cases. So it was mostly related to uh, the drug toxicity. And uh, again, this is a, a study uh, done. It is an unpublished study. So we did the the, the uh, transporters, where we saw the, that um, the cholestatic or mixed features uh, when it is seen in the liver biopsy, especially the duct ductular and canalicular cholestasis then it is uh, the, there will be a loss of uh, the transporters, uh, the three transporters uh, we did, VSEP, MDR3, and MRP2, and the eosinophilia was less where, where uh, the, the, the transporter loss was there. Uh, this is another study from ILBS where uh, this is not related to liver, uh, sorry, uh, liver biopsy, so where we saw that um, and the use of quinolones and beta-lactam antibiotics, they are more uh, causing the thrombocytopenia than the others. The, these are the case, this is a case series where we, um, uh, we had uh, CMB patients treated with gencyclovine or, or vencyclovir. So they show, saw the uh, myeloid maturation arrest where there was the myeloid profiles were less than 10%. These two study, which I thought for the uh, way forward, 
basically we published a study where the non transfusion dependent hemoglobinopathies were basically it is a chronic anemia so the, those patients who has chronic anemia but physiologically they are uh, okay so they have uh, they have more of the glycolytic pathway related enzymes in the liver biopsies and physiologically we can think that sir bas ye last slide hai uh, atp is a currency which is required for the the uh, transport of the toxic metabolites and if the patients or uh, uh, individual is functioning with low currency then there is high chances that the drug resolution in the chronic anemic patients will have a prolonged course or chronic delay so this is one study which we can plan and second is uh, because we see a lot of att related uh, uh, drug injury so we can we can uh, take these four cohorts and uh, identify the drug metabolites which might be leading to the uh, elevated ast alt and the liver damage in uh, isoniazid toxicity summary is very vague so i'll stop here thank you sir thank you chagan very outstanding so many areas you covered delhi is a huge area and uh, also the ilbs data is very massive i think you should publish it more and also uh, chronic delay at least i follow these for by doing the mrcp and also continuous bile test we should also correlate with bile acid levels which i am sure are available in all our cases any comments uh, archana or seva uh, any i would like to ask i think a very uh, general a general question a uh, very comprehensive uh, review of review i think they were really uh, very informative in one of your slides you showed that uh, uh, some of the delhi drugs affect bile transporters right yes sir so do you think or do you can you speculate that these bile transporter inhibitors should be or could be tried along with a standard drugs like entegavir or or uh, tenofovir for viral uh, hepatitis b virus uh, control maybe sir maybe maybe basically they might be having uh, baseline low levels of the transporters so that's why the, that that implied a drug induced liver injury in those cases yes no mem the late resolution of biochemical parameters can be one indicator where we can do this a persistent elevation of jaundice or early fibrosis uh, maybe i was it. thinking whether a liquid biopsy can be helpful to differentiate acute viral hepatitis delhi and delhi and autoimmune hepatitis so if we have the blood and you use the self free dna whether that will be of any help in these patients because every time doing serial biopsies or biopsies are not easy yes. so if you think of and your nadh nadp pathway is also very enjoyable yes. is there another comment from someone comment yes yes sorry yes sir sir mostly the uh, delhi is idiosyncratic so it is like of allergy so the cumulative dose or dose toxicity is is less than 5% of the total delhi cases mostly it is idiosyncratic more than 95% thank you chagan very good thank you.